Our next Tropical Storm update at 1215. Bulletins at once. I'm Charlie Davis. Ten and a half minutes after the hour of 12 noon. November 22nd, 1988. November 22nd, 1963. There are all kinds of significant years in a person's life. Significant for all different kinds of reasons, I suppose. 1963 is a significant year for virtually everyone who was alive at that time and is still alive today. For some of us, 1963 was even a more significant year than the obvious. People have been talking for the last several hours on this radio station, and people are talking all across the country. On, on radio stations and in bars and in, in restaurants and living rooms and front porches and backyards. About where were you? November 22nd, 1963. I had just turned 18 years old. Just a, a few weeks before. On September the 30th. So 1963 was a significant year for me because that was the year that I turned 18. Now, back then, <clears throat> there were really two legal ages. There was 18 and 21. At 18, you no longer had to go to school, and you were responsible for some things, but, of course, you couldn't vote, and you couldn't own property or enter into contracts and things of that nature, at least in the state I grew up in, until you were 21 years of age. So it was kind of a limbo in between childhood and adulthood. I had left school when I was 16 in 1961. And like most high school dropouts, I'd spent two years pretty much just wandering around doing absolutely nothing with my life. With an occasional mean, meaningless job. Meaningless and menial. And then there was 1963. Wow. What a year it was. It was an incredible year. A year that... Even without a Kennedy assassination, I would have never forgotten. It was the year that I bought my first automobile, a 1960 Plymouth Valiant, kind of a, a sick pea green. It was a three-speed on the column, and the previous owner had put in one of those conversion kits. Bought it for damn near nothing. 500 bucks, because the car was really beat. I mean really beat, even though it was only three years old. But I remember that car. It's a marvel I didn't wash the paint off of it. Because it got washed almost every day for months and months and months. 1963, that was the year that I stole a cool guy's girl. Yeah, there was one of these cool guys in Collingswood, and he had a girl, and I stole her. That's right. She started going out with me, stopped going out with him. That was really neat. Whoa, he eventually stole her back. But that's beside the point. I remember that summer. Ah, fantastic. That summer I lost my virginity. That's something to remember. No, not with a cool guy's girl, but with someone who I never even knew her name and an apartment that I didn't really know who it belonged to in New York City. It was all very strange. 1963 was the year I was propositioned for the first time. Unfortunately, it was by a member of the same sex. 1963 was the year that I hitchhiked back and forth across the country, not once but twice. 1963 was the year I spent my first night on a park bench. Spent my first night on a beach. It was the year I first saw the Pacific Ocean. 1963. It was the year I got my own place. I didn't want to get my own place. I had to get my own place. Turns out that it was a shabby little room next to the bathroom, fortunately. I didn't have to residential hotel in downtown Camden, New Jersey. What made it extraordinary is that it was directly across the, across the street from the Cooper Hospital. Cooper Hospital is where I was born. The delivery room literally overlooked this building that I ended up living in in 1963 at the age of 18. I mentioned that room because a lot of things were going to happen in that room. It was in that room that I first read in a column written by Earl Wilson about some weird English musical group called the Beatles. 
It was in that room that I would spend November 24th, 25th, 1963, glued to a little black and white television set. November 22nd, 1963 was just an ordinary day. At least it started out as just an ordinary day. Because of the events later in that day, there are some things I would remember about it that I might not otherwise. For example, in Camden, New Jersey, it was a relatively warm day for the latter part of November. Temperatures probably in the upper 50s or low 60s. The sun was shining. No doubt I woke up somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 o'clock. It would have been my usual waking up time. No doubt I watched the last hour of the Today Show. I used to love doing that. No, it had been an extraordinary year for for me. A year of sex and drugs and rock and roll. A, almost a young man's dream come true. I had seen people and places and things that nice boys from Collingswood, New Jersey, were not meant to see. Only a few months earlier, I was in New York City and I saw people tying off their arms with little rubber hoses and putting makeshift needles into veins and throwing up and doing it all over again in an hour or two. I witnessed a gang rape. I begged for food and money out on the streets, slept on park benches, was propositioned by gay guys. Lost my virginity. Smoked my first joint. Did my first serious heavy drugs. That summer I'd talked to trees. I'd also communicated with nature out on the west coast of this great country. I'd been through the Rocky Mountains. I had been through some of the great cities. It was an extraordinary year. Just a few months earlier. It was a very, very different America than the America that exists today. Things like segregation were, were still a fact of life for millions of Americans. Millions of Americans could not even vote, literally, or attend the, the school of their choosing, or even sit down at a lunch counter. There was growing concern about some place called Vietnam, but only among a handful of people, most people just ignored it. There were new words and phrases and names cropping up all the time. Things like civil rights and Timothy Leary and tune in and turn on and drop out and something called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and a man named Martin Luther King Jr. They were in the news more and more and more back in those days. The king of rock and roll was home from Europe out of uniform. He was back home from the army. But guys like Simon and Garfunkel and, and Bob Dylan and even, even a group called Peter, Paul, and Mary seem to be getting far, far more attention on the radio than the king of rock and roll. My goodness, he was starting to push 30. He was an old dude. The 1964 model cars were in the showrooms. It was the kind of America where people paid attention to such things. It looked like it was going to be a very promising year for Detroit. I had my eye on a an Oldsmobile Starfire convertible. had a list price of about $5,500. It was almost the top of the line, if indeed it wasn't the top of the line. Other people were looking at cars like Corvairs and Mustangs, other such things. And I was working at Albert's. Albert's was a small restaurant and a little suburban community called Haddon Heights, New Jersey. Haddon Heights was, oh, seven or eight miles from Camden, which was right next door to Philadelphia. It was very similar to the town that I grew up in, Collingswood, very similar to all the towns around there, Haddonfield, Westmont, Oak Lynn, Audubon. They all pretty much looked the same. If you were to go through them, you couldn't tell the difference between them. Natives can, of course. And Alberts was on the main street of Haddon Heights, and it was a little place that opened for breakfast and served lunch and even had an early dinner. Nobody went out of their way to go to Albert's. It was just a, a little town, little local restaurant. I used to take the number 21 public service bus from Camden to get there, if memory serves me correct. My memory does serve me correct in terms of what I did there. I was the dishwasher. I got a $1.35 an hour, I think. <laughs> 
Surely not much more if it was any more. I had no idea of what I was going to do with my life. I was a reasonably typical 18-year-old. I mean, not only were there all the events of the first 18 years of my life to sort out, there were all the events of the first 325 days of the year 1963 to try to sort through. And that was such a mind-boggling job that a gig in the kitchen of Albert's was about all I could possibly handle. Now, Albert was a very reasonable man. As I recall, he was probably in his latter 30s, early 40s, half bald, thin, very energetic guy. Albert had, so the story goes, worked for a corporation someplace, had a, a usual corporate-type job shuffling papers around, and he couldn't take it anymore, so he quit and he opened up his own little restaurant right there in Haddon Heights, New Jersey. And it was a reasonably successful little restaurant. The food wasn't great, but it was cheap. And it was edible, and the kitchen was clean, and the waitresses were friendly, and everybody that came into Albert seemed to know each other. He did the cooking on one side of the double doors that led into the kitchen from the outer restaurant. I washed away on the other side of the double doors. Now, Albert liked to talk while he worked. Albert liked to discuss the issues. It was an all but impossible task until I arrived, since very few people that worked at Albert's in the kitchen could discuss the issues with him. They didn't read the newspaper. They didn't watch the evening news. They didn't subscribe to Time magazine. I did. They didn't have much to say about the civil rights movement or, or that problem over in Asia or the ramifications of talking the steel companies into rolling back their prices. But I did. And Albert would stand over at his workstation cooking away all day, and I would stand over at my workstation washing the dishes and talking the day away. It made it go much, much more quickly and much more pleasantly. It was somewhere around 1.30, as I recall. I couldn't tell you the exact time if you put a gun to my head. Albert was just about finished up with a luncheon rush, and I was still up to my ears and dirty dishes from that rush. And we were jabbering back and forth about something or other. <clears throat> there was this little wooden shelf up to the left of the big stainless steel workstation that served as my area of employment. And on that shelf was a radio, kind of one of those cheap Art Deco kind of radios that you would have had back in the late 1940s with some plastic fake chrome and made out of, as I seem to recall it, a burgundy-colored dark plastic. That radio was always tuned to radio station WIP. Now, WIP was the kind of radio station in Philadelphia that your parents would have listened to. But in 1963, a hip young dude did not want to listen to WIP. But then Albert wasn't a hip young dude. Albert was a parent, and it was his restaurant, and it was his radio. And usually the radio was on just barely enough to realize it was on, not really quite loud enough to listen to. Not quite loud enough to listen to. And somebody came running into the kitchen and said, Oh, my God, the president's been shot. Turn up the radio. And I was the one who was working closest to the radio. And I reached up and I turned up the volume just in time to hear the announcer say, they were going to switch to Dallas, where a terrible, terrible thing had happened. The president of the United States had just been shot. When I initially sat down to talk, to make some notes to talk about that day, my first impression was that at the moment that we turned up the radio, everything came to a halt. And thinking about it, that's not really what happened. Actually, everything went into slow motion. Albert kind of stopped cooking. I slowly cleaned up the dishes as we listened to the radio, waited for word from some place called Parkland Hospital in Dallas as to how the president was. Suddenly those waitresses and other kitchen help who never really seemed to have anything to say about anything that was going on in the world outside of their own little sphere were passing comments. <clears throat> 
everybody hoped that the president would make it. Some people were talking about how much they admired him. Other people were talking about how much they disagreed with him. But that had nothing to do with, with the man being shot. That wasn't right. And then it suddenly started to dawn on us. These kinds of things did not happen in America. Damn it, this kind of stuff did not happen. This was the kind of stuff that happened in, <clears throat> in South America and in Southeast Asia and, and, and sometimes even in Europe. But this kind of stuff didn't happen in America. There must be something awfully, awfully wrong. And at about that time, people started to wonder, my God, is, is, is this the beginning of a war? Sometimes wars start with the assassination of a, a leader. And so we listened all the closer to the radio. And then something in the neighborhood of a half hour or so later, there was the report. The initial report that, indeed, President John F. Kennedy, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, was dead. Then the world did come to a halt. Alberts was a classic Haddon Heights type of building. It was... Double wide store. The exterior was colonial, if you will, early American. When you walked into Albert's on the left hand side was a luncheon counter with, with those little spools or stools rather that spin around. And in the center of the store and then off to the to the right hand side were tables and booths. And basically the, the bull up and down the street would come into Albert's for a quick lunch and they would sit at the counter and the men and women who were shopping or taking care of business who had stopped in for lunch would sit at the booths and the tables. Albert's did a hell of a lunch. The lunch actually lasted till about 2 o'clock on most days. Well, suddenly the orders stopped coming in, but the people were still there. But slowly, one by one, they got up and left. We moved the radio out into the front of the restaurant. And the kitchen help, dishwasher included, were permitted to come out and sit at those stools and listen to the radio with the customers. There were probably about half a dozen of us who actually worked at Albert's and probably another half a dozen customers who just could not leave, who just sat there. Occasionally there would be a, a sentence uttered, but primarily it was silence waiting for the the air raid sirens to go off, waiting for somebody to come on and say, gotcha, practical joke, waiting for we didn't know what. Just sitting there. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.30, as I recall, Albert said, well, it's not right. We should all go home. We're not going to do any business anyway, and I don't want to do any business. Not today. And so we started to close the place up, and the customers left, and it was just Albert and the crew doing the final touches. And as we started for the door, Albert said, I, I don't think I'm going to be open tomorrow. I'll pay you, but, but don't come in. We're, we're not going to open. It's not right. And we said, okay, and started for the door again. And Albert said, wait a second. I don't think it's right to be open until after the funeral. So don't come back to work until after the funeral, the day after the funeral. We'll open again. If everything's okay. It was a strange day. A day that started out just like any other kind of day. Maybe even better than most since it was really beautiful weather for that time of the year. Nobody knew when they went off for work that day that life would never again be quite the same. Never ever again. Some people say we lost our innocence that day. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. I don't know. Who really knows for sure? Strangely enough, many of the problems that we talk about today existed then. Maybe not on quite as large a scale, but they existed. I remember getting on the bus, the old, oh, the car, the car was gone by then. It fell apart. So I remember getting on the old number 21 public service bus and going back into Camden, back to my rented room directly across the street from the hospital I was born in. 
that cost me $10 a week, and I had a very difficult time paying the rent on it. I remember buying the newspapers. I always bought the newspapers. And there were extra editions and bulletin editions and special editions. Going up into the room and turning on the, the tiny little black and white TV set. Just stacking the newspapers and sitting there watching whatever was going on. It was almost a miracle. It was, it was indeed television's finest hour. Using all kinds of tricks and stunts and gadgets that I had never seen used before, but putting us live in touch with what was actually going on. There was film footage and sometimes even videotape footage of some of the events that I had missed that day. Like Lyndon Johnson standing there with his hand on a Bible next to Mrs. Kennedy. Being sworn in on an airplane in, in Texas. And cuts back and forth in interviews with all kinds of people. And on and on and on it seemed to go. I couldn't take it anymore. I got up and went out and got drunk. I wasn't old enough to drink. But I knew this little bar in a working class neighborhood where they didn't ask questions. And especially on days like that. And I went down there and I sat there and I drank my drink of the day, which was screwdrivers. I probably had a ham sandwich. I usually did when I went to that bar. But I don't really remember getting that drunk, though I tried. Somewhere in the neighborhood of midnight, I walked back up to the main street to catch another bus to go back down to the room. There was one man standing on the corner, a young black man, perhaps in his mid-twenties. We just kind of looked at each other. Seemed as though the bus was never going to come. And finally we started talking to each other, basically asking each other, why? Why, why did this happen? How did this happen? Did it really happen? Are we really? Is this a bad dream? And finally the bus came and we got on together and we were probably the only people on the bus. I can't really remember any others. And he got off before I did and I finally got off and went back to my little room. The astonishing thing is, hard as I try, I can remember utterly, absolutely, positively nothing of November 23rd. 1963. The next thing I can remember, the next thing I can remember is laying across the bed, again on a bright sunny morning, not quite as warm as it had been November 22nd, several degrees cooler, watching television. The preliminary ceremonies for the funeral. And then a cutaway to Dallas. Because they were going to be moving that that awful man, that, that terrible, awful man who shot the president and, and caused all of his grief and aggravation. What a strange couple of days. Almost immediately there was all kinds of crazy talk about conspiracies and plots and cloak and dagger kinds of stuff and... They were blaming everybody from Khrushchev to Castro to even people in our own government. There was, there was even talk about Lyndon Johnson. And we still didn't know if we were going to war. We still didn't know if the country was under attack. We just didn't know what was happening, and it was awful. To tell you the truth, 25 years later, I still don't know what to think. I have no idea. No idea why it happened. No idea who's behind it. No idea as to whether or not any of the conspiracy talk holds any water at all. I still don't know what to think 25 years later. The room was... It's a corner room. It was on the second floor. There were two windows that overlooked the Cooper Hospital and one window that overlooked a parking lot. It had a double bed 
matching bureau, a matching chest of drawers. A wooden chair with wooden arms, wooden legs, but big cushions for the seat in the back. And a straight-back chair. I had the television on the straight-back chair. I had gone out that morning and bought some donuts. And I had come back and was laying there across the bed eating the donuts, watching the funeral. And suddenly they cut away to the basement in Dallas. And damn it, there was that... There was that little guy that had shot the president and, and somebody was shooting him. Right there on my television, right there in my house. I would eventually move out of that rented room. I would live in a lot of places, some almost as bad, some much better, thank you. I would come to find out more about that group that I read about in Earl Wilson's column from England. I would come to find out more about girls and life in general, and there would be a procession of cars, and there would be more drugs, and more places to see, and people to get to know, and things to do, and experience, and possess. There would be any number of unforgettable days in my life. It was the first day I worked on a radio station. I will never forget it as long as I live came several years later, seven years later, in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. It was a memorable day. There was the day when men walked on the moon, where for hour upon hour upon hour again I sat glued to a television set. My nerve ends tingling, my, my flesh wet with sweat and anticipation and, and excitement and fear waiting for a couple of human beings to set foot safely on the moon. There were wedding days. I remember them both. It was the day that my mother died. A very, very strange day. A day that started out pretty much like any other. A day where I sh was shooting a television commercial and got a call right in the middle of the commercial that my mother was about to die and looked around at all the people who had worked all afternoon for the miserable television commercial that now depended upon me and didn't know what to do. There was the call that came many hours later that she had actually died. Oh, I'll never forget that. Suddenly a thunderstorm arose. The clock started ringing off the hours and the shutters were blown open by the breeze as the phone rang with a call that my mother had finally passed on. It was a day I shall never forget. But somehow none of these days really ever approached the emptiness of November 22nd, 1963. The uncertainty, even the fear I shall never forget that day as long as I live. Nor will I ever understand it. I know that it changed my life. But I don't know how. I don't know what would have been had the events of November 22nd, 1963 never, t never taken place. I, I don't know what would have happened. But I know that it's not the same. I don't know if it's better, I don't know if it's worse, but I know that it's not the same. That angers me. It's not fair that somebody played with my life and with your life and maybe with the, with the entire world. Nobody's supposed to have that kind of power. Nobody's supposed to be able to, to have that much of an effect. No, I didn't like John Kennedy. I didn't support him in 1960, and I didn't like him in 1963. I thought most everything he got involved in was stupid. I really disagreed with many of his policies. About the only things that I really liked were the way he talked down the, the steel barons, 
and made them roll back their prices. That seemed kind of neat. And I liked the way that he dealt with the Cuban Missile Crises. Although at the time I did not understand, I did not realize that we had the Soviet Union ringed with missiles a hell of a lot closer than 90 miles, thank you. And I assumed that they were putting the missiles there because they wanted to go to war and that they really were planning on taking out Chicago and Philadelphia and Miami and Atlanta. But but that's that's beside the point. That's all in, in retrospect. I, I, liked, I liked the way he did that. I, I liked the way he stood up to them damned Russians, made them take their missiles and made them go home. But that's about the only thing I liked. But damn it, you don't go shooting people because you don't agree with them or you don't like some of the things that they're doing. These were disagreements. These, these were differences of opinion. And I couldn't understand this, 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 little, this little wimpy guy bringing his rifle to work and, and hiding behind the, the boxes and, and shooting John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I mean, I would have much preferred Richard Nixon. There, there are no two ways about that. But even by 1963, I was be beginning to concede that, well, at least the Kennedys were interesting. They were good press, and my mother liked them. Made her happy, kept her off my back. So maybe they weren't all bad. So I would ask you for the remainder of this afternoon, where were you in November of 1963? I'm not talking about a physical location. I'm talking about where were you? And do you think the world changed? How do you think the world changed? I honestly don't know. I truly do not know. I don't know that anybody does, but what the hell, I'll listen to an opinion. I won't shoot you for it. Might shoot you down, but I won't shoot you. Let me give you the telephone numbers. In Pinellas County, 461-9352, 461-WFLA. In Hillsborough County, 990-9352-990, WFLA. And, of course, there's even the practical joke line. One two two three nine seven nine seven one two two three nine seven nine seven. There have probably been at least twenty five years worth of where were you's that dealt with I was in class, I was wherever. I don't know that I've ever really heard a where were you headwise in nineteen sixty three. We tend to remember things a lot differently than they really were. Sometimes the, the picture gets a little rosier. Sometimes you tend to forget things that were really very important. But there were kids doing drugs in 1963, and there were anti-war protesters, and there were all kinds of things going on, many of which are still very major problems today. I don't know that the world would have been any better had John Fitzgerald Kennedy not been assassinated. I don't really know how it changed because he was. I just know that it did change. I don't know that we lost our innocence on that day. I know that we lost a president. And I know that we did have to finally come to the grips with the the horrible fact that indeed sometimes even in America awful things could happen. As you well know, a lot of awful things happened in a great deal of rapid succession from that point on, or at least so it seems. I don't know that one had anything to do with the other. I just know that it's a fact that awful things happened. And that nobody seems to remember those awful things happening before November 22nd, 1963.